<laughs> All right. So again, it is January 4th, 2014. If you're watching this on any other day, you're watching an archive. Otherwise, you're live and you can ask questions of us. Chris is going to give us a um, some overview on lithium-ion batteries for RV health systems. And we do have a live studio audience here in Cedar Key. Um, and we uh, then he will give you an update because it has been two and a half years since we installed our system. So if you're joining us, we are Technomadia, Sheree and Chris. Kiki is feeling shy today, so she will not be giving her um, technical advice. Although if the slides jump around at random, it that's is her fault. Sometimes sits on the trackpad inside, and it just happens. Actually, it happened two just over two years ago. We gave this presentation with our. Uh, quote preliminary report on um, on our experiences installing these lithium batteries at the Arcadia bus rally, um, and I only had because we're dealing with so many other tech and setup issues. I only had the slightest bit of time to update the slides from the two year ago presentation, um, but we'll be able to talk to the actual. I can't believe it's been two and a half years. That just kind of blows my mind. But we'll share two and a half years of living on lithium, right. which I believe is an antidepressant. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Chris to uh, wow you with lithium facts. Okay, so um, just to set a little bit of context, particularly for the people who don't necessarily know us in our bus, um, when we bought this bus uh, two and a half-ish years ago, it had no house batteries whatsoever. Um, it had a really janky old uh, converter um, that, that makes a, a DC power out of AC power and um, had essentially a very meager electrical system. And one of the very quick, rapid upgrades we had to do was figure out what we wanted to do for batteries. And we wanted to have a system that could go off-grid, something that could actually power the air conditioner off of just batteries, something that could do a lot of really fancy electrical things. And so we'd either be faced with adding literal tons of, a of AGM or lead batteries and finding a space to put them, or we decided on the spur of the moment to be pioneers and playing with lithium batteries for RV systems. There's there may have been a little heat involved. We were in Arizona in the <laughs> summer, so heat fatigue might have been yes. involved. So we, so we decided, decided to dive in and say, you know, we, we're geeks. We like to be on the bleeding edge. We'll go have fun with this um, and uh, explore. And it's been two and a half years. Are people hearing okay? No, they can't hear you. Ah. Turn down the wind a little, and it won't tilt further down once you lower the leg in front. Oh. Hi, internet. There's an audience here. <laughs> now I gotta face two directions. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, so that was our urgency. Let's go play with lithium and. The, the reasons why, you know, I've been researching the reasons for years, and lithium is, is basically all set to be the next generation of batteries in RVs. It's just a year away still, still now, two and a half years later, but it's a, a fun place to play. And let's explain a little bit about batteries. And I'm, Actually, did you just put the camera in front of the slides for everyone else? Yeah. Okay. You're not going to be able to do both. You've got to set this up well. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, Assuming you can see the slides, the, just to kind of rush through these a little bit, the, the basics of um, lead acid batteries have been the same for um, over 100 years, actually quite a bit over. Uh, the, the um, what's that? Okay. The, the, yeah, the 12 volt starting battery you would have been able to actually get you know, back in a Model T time frame when they got rid of the hand crank starts. Uh, it's the same ch chemistry has been used forever. You hear about the newer batteries, the AGM and the gel cell. Those are still lead acid batteries that just the lead and the acid are packaged differently. In the case of an AGM, that stands for applied, um, applied glass mat. So it's, the acid is soaked into a mat so it's no longer flowing in liquid. A flooded lead cell is acid inside those things. You can, you can look inside the battery and see the juice. And a gel cell is, is basically gelatin, a type of gelatin added to the acid so that it is also um, not flowing, not liquid. They're, they're very nice advancements over the traditional lead acid battery, but they are still it, chemically and in performance capability-wise basically a lead acid battery. Um, lithium is, is a very, very different animal. It's a different kind of battery, a different battery chemistry, um, and it's still um, technology that is, is evolving and changing and being perfected in a lot of ways. There's a lot of different formulas. Um, some of them are secret recipes of how to mix up your lithium battery chemistry. 
some of the common ones would be lithium cobalt oxide. The, the type that we have is a lithium iron phosphate, uh, often called uh, LIFEPO or LFP. Um, one of the, the major differences you'll have is the number of cells. A 12 volt lead acid battery has six cells, if you look at the top of a, of a battery. Pause for a moment for a fifth wheel to go by. Hopefully they're not parking here. <laughs> I'll show you. We are at a campground. <laughs> we are dealing with real, actual campground life. <laughs> real, yeah, real campground technical issues and trying to do a presentation in daylight and you know all these these fun things. Oh, uh, we'd like to try and share. And it's it's fun. And oh, by the way, because we got this the first time we presented this is we don't have an angle. We're not trying to sell anything. In fact, we're trying to discourage people from doing lithium unless you really want to play with this. So, this so is not mainstream. This is and, not and, ready for the mainstream. And, and this, <laughs> is a, this is not a sales pitch. We're, we've had people in the past see our presentation on lithium and think, oh, did you sell any afterwards? And we're like, no, no. We're sharing our experiments. We're sharing because we like to share. Yeah. And this is not an invitation to send us lots of questions <laughs> later to do your system. Yes, and we're not offering lithium consulting services either. <laughs> um, so the, 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 one of the, the basic fundamental differences was um, uh, lead cells would be six to make a 12-volt battery. Uh, lithium cells would be four to make a 12 volt battery. So they're, they're, they're different in the cell side. Um, talking about the downsides of traditional lead acid batteries, um, typically you'll, you'll see recommendations of when you're using your lead acid batteries to only use between 30 and 50 percent of their capacity. They don't like to be drained. Even, even a deep cycle battery is, starts to age quickly if you use more than 50 percent of its capacity. And well, most people have actually, unless they have a real battery monitoring system on the rig, they tend to not even know what their battery capacity is and how deeply they're using it. That's why a lot of batteries die within a year or two or three or start performing very, very poorly because uh, the, the batteries suffer badly from abuse. Um, the, even a deep cycle battery might only get four or five hundred deep cycles out of it. Even a heavy duty deep cycle battery um, can you know, be dead in two years of use. Um, and then one of the most uh, frustrating things for, for lead acid batteries, if you want to use them in an off-grid system or on powered off by a generator or something, is that they are very slow and inefficient to charge. The, you know, if you've seen three-stage chargers, there's usually a bulk stage. That first 80% of charging can happen fairly quickly. It'll happen as fast as the charger can put out. But that final 20% might take four or five hours or even longer. Where that, that pushing in that last bit of charge into the battery takes a very long time. Um, the, you think, okay, well, maybe I just won't charge my battery all the way up. If you're running on a generator, you don't want to run your generator for four or five hours extra past your 80% capacity. You don't want to burn all that gas just to push that little extra power in. But lead, lead cells age very quickly if you don't get them regularly up to a full 100% charge. So a lot of people who just boondock a lot and only charge by, bat only charge by generator, they end up killing their batteries way, way earlier than they normally would because they don't give them a regular, I'm going to let the run generator run five hours straight or eight hours straight to get a full top off charge. We know people who are smarter about this who make it a once a week thing that they will actually do a full top off charge, make sure they get all the way through absorption and have their batteries get to float. It, it preserves your battery life. Um, as you say, topping off, if you're doing that top off charge with the generator, you're burning a lot of gas to put a very little current into the battery just to get it to that top off 100%. Or if you're doing solar. Yes, and also solar, <laughs> the end of the day, the sun's going to set before you get to 100% because the battery isn't charging very quickly, that final 20%. So if you're running on solar, you've got to have a, you know oversized amount of power or run your generator still once a week just to keep your, gener your batteries getting to a fully topped off state. Um, there's a thing called uh, Pukert's loss. If you want to run high current things off your batteries, not just light, like but things like microwaves or air conditioners, um, Pukert's loss, the, based on the resistance inside the battery and the, the chemistry of it, the more current you pull out of it, the less capacity you get. So lead acid batteries, if you're running something high current off the battery, uh, like trying to run an air conditioner or a microwave, your, say your, your 100 amp hour battery might effectively only have 60 amp hours. So, and then when you factor in that you should not take it below 50, your 100 amp hour battery has more like 30 amp hours of usable high current capacity. So there's, there's some uh, big disadvantages to lead acid batteries. They were just, you know, they, they worked, they were great, they were, they were what existed up until now. 
Um, and then, of course, the other big disadvantage is literally the big disadvantage is that they are big and very, very heavy. They're literal bricks of lead. Um, and uh, if you've seen what a big uh, 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 Class A might have in its battery banks of some several ACs, particularly one that's set up to go off-grid and has big battery banks, it might have six AC batteries. Those things are huge and ridiculously heavy. So. On the, the, the flip side, lithium is, is basically fixes most of the issues of lead-acid batteries. Um, theoretically, it is safe to use, the, the batteries don't really care if you use 80% of capacity. You don't have to worry about deep cycling. <laughs> Every lithium battery is a deep cycle battery. Um, the cycle life, uh, the laboratory cycle life is 2,000 or 5,000 cycles, potentially longer. It's harder to have real world examples because the, the, the batteries have not lived out in the field that long, and also the care and feeding of them is still being um, tweaked and figured out. We'll share our experiences. Ours have aged quicker than they should have, so so we're not getting the cycle life out of them that we should have, that we expected. Oh, the capacity. Yeah, the capacity, the capacity out of them. <laughs> um, but well, that would, that's just a sign of the cycle cycle life dropping off sooner than it should have. But we've got theories as to why. But you know, it's, it's experimental. We're living on the cutting edge. Um, the great things about lithiums is they're very very fast and efficient for charging. Um, you can fast charge the battery to essentially 100% capacity. There's Which is no great if you have a generator that can output a lot of juice. That means that you can get your ba you can take advantage of all of that power coming out of your high capacity generator. Only have to run it for an hour or two and get a full charge. So it's just limited to the charging ability of your charger. And then. Yeah, so actually, theoretically, if you have a big enough battery charger, which hardly anybody would, you could charge a lithium battery in just 20 minutes. You know, it can take current that fast of its, to, of its capacity. And then the, the, the lead-acid downside of it, does, it really needs to be fully charged every so often, 100% every, you know, once a week or at least once a month. It keeps the battery healthy. Lithiums could care less. Um, in fact, there's, there's some evidence that over time, storing lithiums longer term Leaving them at 80% capacity or so actually preserves their life more so than, than trying to bring them up to 100% regularly. Which theoretically makes them ideal for solar. So that yes. if you just get a few couple hours of sun during the day, you can yeah. just take advantage of a little bit of sun, soak them in, and not have to worry about doing a top-off charge every yeah. so often. Yeah. Now then that Pukert's loss I was telling you about of drawing out high current, there's a essentially uh, a, a, you know, infinitesimally small Pukert's loss with lithium. So if you want to build a system to draw to do high current things like run hair dryers or toaster ovens or microwave ovens or air conditioners. Or space heaters like Or space doing. heaters. <laughs> um, yeah, because we, we, we don't have a furnace, a gas furnace in here, so we've been running our heater off the batteries to get us through the coldest parts of the night. Um, that the, the battery would drain a lot faster if we were running that, the, the, fur, the space, electric space heater off of a lead acid battery than it would off of uh, the lithiums. And then the lithiums weigh uh, a fraction. Uh, they're, they're much lighter and about half the size of lead acid batteries. Right, so you want to show what yeah, we could like? Yeah, we could point out the first visual aids. Okay, so oh. this is our 500 amp hour battery bank. Let's see if I can. It is made of 20 amps. <sighs> How do I get this stupid thing off? Click. There you go. Sorry for the motion sickness video, <laughs> people. All right. So that green thing there is the 500 amp hours of battery power. And for size comparison, here's my hand. There's 20 of you. So this is 20 cells in it. This weighs 140 pounds. So, so this is a 3.2 volt cell, and. So we wanted to build a 500 amp hour bank, and to do that with the cells we had available at the time, these are 100 amp hour 3.2 volt cells. So as I said, with lithium it takes four cells to make a 12 volt bank, and we wanted 500 amp hours, so we had to bolt five of these in parallel, and then four of them in series, um, and constructed a single battery that is now all one physical unit all bolted together out of those um, cells and uh, uh, put into series and parallel. And you know, jumping ahead a little bit, one of, one of the, the reasons we think we've gotten less capacity than we, we should have out of them is when you put cells in parallel, they, the, the weakest of the cell um, affects all of them. And the we, however one is aging badly, 
all the rest of them that are in that parallel chunk will age badly as well. Putting battery cells in parallel is you know, generally inevitable, but it's not a good thing. Particularly putting five in, in parallel is not, not the greatest thing in the world. Quick question? Or? Yeah, why did you go uh, choose to go 12 volt instead of up into a higher voltage, like 24? Because uh, we have a 20, we have a 12 volt chassis. Yeah, we, we, we would have loved to, <laughs> loved to go uh, 24, but I wanted to be able to charge off the alternator as well. This is a 1961 bus. They didn't have 24 volt back then. Oh, well, yeah, they started to. The next, Not on buses, the next they bus didn't. Did. Um, but yeah, most RVs are, are still only most Class A's are 12 volts unless they're uh, um, a Prevo chassis now. But 24 volt would have been great. It would have required changing the bus systems if we wanted to t tie into them. Okay, can you put the stupid thing back on? <laughs> Just put it the other way. It'd be easier to get it on and off. It's going to be our worst video on Christmas. <laughs> yes. There. So, this sounds like magic. <laughs> so why do you recommend not doing it? Oh, because it's not magic. <laughs> well, so, so we recommend doing it if you're prepared to have unexpected downsides. It's not like you're going to have somebody who's a warranty. You're not going to have somebody who's going to say, do this, this, and this, and it's going to work out exactly like you want. Because the, those of us who are playing with lithium are still figuring it out. The, the recommendations of like, well, here's how you should care and feed for your battery have changed several times over the two and a half years we've had it. There are some companies that are selling lithium as like you know fully supported commercial products, uh, primarily targeting the marine industry right now. You know, actually for the past two plus years, you've been able to buy lithium systems for yachts, yachts at yacht prices with yacht quality and high level support. Um, not necessarily something you'd want to do in a small in in a, a smaller budget than a, a yacht life. Um, the, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the cost in a second, but the, um, um, yeah, you're, you're either still in experimental phase and it's very cost effective or relatively cost effective, or you're paying a lot to have somebody else worry about it and support you and maybe send, fly out a technician to adjust something if things change in the future. So if you're into electricity, go for it. If you want somebody to tell you what to do and you're not on the odd budget, it's not ready for prime time yet. You're taking a lot of chances <laughs> with it. So you're, you're going to have a higher upfront cost than you would going AGM. Although AGMs and lead acids, they are continuing to go up in price, whereas lithium is staying and or dropping. So, yes. they, so the price threshold is, is mediating out, but it is still a higher upfront cost to get the same capacity of lithium, even with all the advantages right. of it. So, but over time, if, this, if theory proves out, the, per, uh, the lifetime cost is lower. Right. But that's all in theory. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, you know, I guess one thing that kind of helps explain the, where the costs come in is this This is a lithium cell like this, a 3.2 volt cell. Um, there, I think almost all of them are made in China at the moment. And they're, are, they've gotten pretty cost effective. But the U.S. rules for batteries is these cells all go through safety testing to be imported into the U.S. They have to have been through some pretty extensive safety testing. And so the cells can be shipped through the mail with you know, hazardous <laughs> duty mailing and stuff, but they're allowed to be shipped so you can order them. They're allowed to be transported and stuff. But once you bolt four of these together to make a battery, that entire assembly has to have been through the same safety testing as the cells. And since there's not a huge market for it, um, unless you're building your own battery from the cells, there's very few people who have done that extra testing who are able to ship batteries, fully assembled batteries already um, through through even f through even freight to be delivered. So that, that's why there's only a tiny handful of companies that are selling full 12 volt battery assemblies already ready to go. Um, and they have very limited sizes available. Um, so that's one of the big challenges is the, is the safety testing. There's really should be no difference between, you know, four cells. And actually I know one company that gets around it, they just don't bolt the cells together across the top. They'll package up the battery, and they just don't put the cross beams on it. Then it's legal to ship. Once they put the cross beams on, well, it's a new assembly. It has to have been through a whole new round of very expensive safety testing. Um, that's one of the challenges. Uh, let's see. Got things here on the 
Um, the charge and discharge curves of, of lead and uh, lithium and FICO lives. Get past that. The one of the, the main differences with uh, lithium is the discharge and the discharge curve is very very flat. You might have seen this in like lithium camera batteries and stuff. Is they just keep taking pictures, keep taking pictures until they stop. They have a very long life. Uh, lithium batteries in an RV are the same way. Is where you'll have um, basically you know your 13 volts all the way across until the battery is dead, which means a lot of people have in their RV, the only way they tell where their battery capacity is is they might have a little LED readout that says their voltage, or it has just like three lights that say low, medium, high. That is completely useless information with lithium because the battery is essentially high all the way across until it hits its end point. Um, now it's very important to have a real way to measure the battery capacity by measuring the amps in and out, even more so. That's very important on lead-acid batteries as well. But lithium, because of the way the charge curve is, totally flat, very, very important to have some way to know where you're at on that. Um, let's see. Okay, so we talked a little bit about cost ahead of the curve. Uh, if you're willing to live on the bleeding edge, you can do this. And so lifetime costs get theoretically very interesting, as we said. Nope. Um, of, uh, let's go to care and feeding. So lithium batteries, particularly because they are such a flat um, charge and discharge curve, it's very easy to accidentally over-discharge them if you have them just plugged into a regular system with no cutoff, where if you leave a light on or the fan running all night long and the battery charger never kicks in, somebody unplugs your rig, if the battery drains all the way down, that's bad for any battery. It really affects its battery life. But for lithium batteries, if they reach their zero point, there's a pretty decent chance that they will never come back. So you'll have your very expensive battery die and not just come back weaker, but stay dead. Oh, um, that means not coming back. Yeah, well, yeah, so we'll stay back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, particularly a flooded lead acid battery, you might be able to, to you know, um, top off the acid, put it on an equalizing charge, bubble the battery for a while, and get it back. It will have suffered from having been discharged completely once, but you'll probably not have ruined it. Lithium batteries, you've got to be very careful because you can ruin them uh, if you get them below zero. Um, same for overcharging. Overcharging is very bad for any batteries, but uh, flooded lead cells, you can put more water in to replace what you boiled off, and the battery's damaged, but it can potentially come back lithium. You overcharge them too far. Um, well, if you overcharge them too far and recklessly, you'll actually have these swell out. Um, they tend not to catch fire. That's uh, other type of lithium batteries. These types, the LFPs, don't burn, which is a good thing, but you can still ruin them by overcharging them. Um, and then uh, cells, ideally, all your cells in series should be balanced so they have the same voltage um, so that there's not having a weak cell beating <laughs> down the others. That also matters for lead acid batteries, but people usually don't bother with it. On lithium, it's usually invested more in the system. You try and balance your cells. So you have a thing called a, a battery management system that helps you take care of your batteries and protect them. Um, and then you also use a programmable charger, so you can have be very precise about your charging and, uh, and how far you charge them. Um, I'll show you the pieces of our system. So we used... 20 of these. These are 100 amp hour cells from Elite Power Solutions. These are GBS cells um, from GBS in China. Uh, the total cost for our battery bank was about $3,100. The Elite EMS that watches each cell looks for if the cell is getting too low or too high voltage and then literally pulls the plug on the battery to protect it uh, was about $300. It's a little chain of sense boards, which you'll be able to see when you stick your head in the thing on top of the batteries, and the sense boards measure the voltage per cell, the temperature per cell, and basically this, if there's an alarm, it pulls the plug on the battery. Um, our inverter charger, here's uh, our replacement one. Got our brand new one ready to go in. It's a, a Victron 3000 VA Multi Plus. It's a very, very nice inverter charger um, that lets you control everything about it. Uh, the Victron has sent us a new one because they want us to beta test their new control panel and um, also their new inverter has the ability to work with third party EMS systems. So um, it will be able to be triggered automatically by another EMS if you wire it up correctly. So they've very nicely sent us one to beta test to make sure how well that works with lithium, which is pretty cool. 
And then the, the battery monitor system we have is 200 hours. So that's that's kind of all the different pieces of our setup. You can see here some pictures. We, we actually had to build the battery from scratch. Um, so we got all these cells. The, the people at Elite um, coached us through it, let us use a, a press to kind of squeeze these all into batteries and strap metal bars around them so they would never expand, bolt across to make them into one monolithic 500 amp hour battery. And um, there's all these pictures are online. Yes. Like I said, technomadia.com slash lithium. Right. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the, both the whys of lithium is the, the advantages um, and, and our particular setup, what we built. Now, I guess two and a half years later, what we've what we've learned and what has changed in the two and a half years since. Um, so, when we built this, there really wasn't a lot of other options to. There wasn't a lot of other ways to go about building a lithium system that would be uh, uh, suitable for an RV house system. Uh, Elite had never had one done before. We were the first. So they were working with lithium and smart batteries. Yeah, so, so there was two companies that were looking to take their stuff and package it into prepackaged systems to go. Uh, as far as uh, amateurs building it themselves, we were the first. Other people have come along since. Other people have done it with other batteries and other cell providers. Uh, the things that have changed, um, well, um, see, things that have changed. One, when we built this, we had to build, we wanted a 500 amp hour battery bank. So we had to bolt five of these together in parallel, and they're literally wired in parallel with cross beams across the top, metal cross beams, um, to have each cell in parallel. Um, the uh, EMS could only measure um, and monitor cells in series, so that's part of why we had to do this. Now the Elite's EMS has evolved that they can actually have separate strings of sense boards, and you could run. Um, Rather than build a single 500 amp hour battery out of 100 amp hour cells, you could build, uh, you could have used five 12 volt batteries um, that would not be wired in parallel across the middle. You wire them at parallel at the ends. Um, and the advantage of that is that you don't have all the cells, the weak cells, pulling down, pulling each other down. Um, their EMS now would be able to wire, just have more sense boards. Instead of having four sense boards, you'd have 20 sense boards on top of here. Um, so that's one thing that's changed is their recommendation for building a system like that with these cells. And there's now on the market also companies that have bigger cells that are more suitable for doing RV house style. Presumably. Um, theoretically. Pre presumably. Well, well, yeah, theoretically they're more suitable because you'd have single cells. There's a company called Balcon that is a U.S. distributor. And I believe Forrest is on the chat. Oh, Forrest Olivier. Perfect. So I was just going to mention a friend of ours who was here last year um, saw our batteries last year and we've been in touch with online, has been going with these Balcon cells. He's just started this past week building his own setup. Uh, the Balcon cells come in sizes as large as 1,000 amp hours per single cell. So mm -hmm. instead of, of um, these little volt. things, yeah, little, the 3.2 volt, 100 amp hour thing, imagine something that's 10 times bigger. Still very small compared to uh, uh, lead acid would be, but four of those bolted together is all it would take. And over time, those should hopefully age much better because you're not trying to put 20 things in parallel. You're just putting four but things in parallel. But Elite has some concerns over those. Yes. Elite has concerns that just because internally they're still built with a whole bunch of stuff in parallel. So it, a lot comes down to manufacturing quality. Um, we don't know of anybody who's built a big house system with Balcon cells, but Forrest is, his just went live this past week. It's finally powered up. Um, he built a 1,000 amp hour system for his Newell, which is going to be absolutely awesome. So that would be twice the, the battery capacity we have. So it'll be interesting to see in two or three years how it's where, where his Where his is aged to. Um, and Balcon also has 7 amp, 100 amp hour and 500 amp hour cells. So those would be one of the places I'd start if I was building again is rather than have to worry about how to structure something big out of things, small, small cereal box size units, I'd just go for bigger cells to begin with. Um, what else has changed over the two and a half years? Um, the One of the other things that has potentially aged our cells is um, there's not a lot of good theory on the best way to float lithium batteries. Um, you know, the, you know the float voltages. Once your batteries are charged, you kind of come to a float voltage. For lead acid, it's important to keep them always topped up. Um, and also for RVs, that float voltage is what runs your 12 volt systems while you're plugged into shore power. Um, with lithium, theoretically, lithiums don't need to be floated and really don't want to be floated. Once you charge them, you just let them go. 
So the recommendations for where, what, what would be the ideal float voltage has actually come down quite a bit from when we first built our system. So the original recommendation we had was to float at 13.8 volts once you fully charged. It's now come down first to 13.6, now to 13.55 is the last recommendation we got from Elite. Um, and our cells could have aged over the two years of having them floating at a higher voltage might have aged them quicker. There's, we're, we're not a lot of people have done this yet, so we don't really know. Um, one thing some other people have done, and I think actually this is what Forrest's plan is, is he's going to have a, a way to disconnect his batteries entirely when he's on shore power so they're not floating. Um, and I think he's initially planning to do that manually, but uh, there's, there can be systems designed to charge your batteries and then just automatically put them out of the circuit, let your converter just power your 12 volt things directly with the batteries disconnected until they're needed. Could you uh, theoretically break the uh, large bank? Um, yeah, you probably could. There, there's actually, yeah, some people have experimented with that. Okay. Uh, the, the question was, could you, could you divide? I'll wait for the RV to drive past. Uh, the question is, can you um, theoretically divide the bank into two and just charge them up separately and have one going down while one is coming up? Um, that introduces a big piece of manual management. Um, for most of us RVers, we want it to just, just work with a minimal intervention. Uh, which is how we've treated our system. We've, we've tried to avoid having to do a lot of manual management. Um, but you know, as the, as the experiments progress and people learn what is the best way to get maximum life in practice, those systems could be automated. And um, I think you of all people could make an app for that. <laughs> well, it would be less an app as a little embedded controller on your charger yeah, yeah. that would, uh, with a couple of relays that would switch it back and forth. Um, so. Well, we talked about, I, I didn't, didn't really share the specifics, but we've um, been measuring how our batteries are. Every so often we'll do a full drain test to see where our capacity is. And unfortunately, we never really did this when we first got them because we were still babying them. But um, after a year of using them, we did a full drain test and I was able to drain about 450 amp hours out of them before we hit the, the, the battery is, uh, is getting critical point. <coughs> Um, so which the 500 amp hours? 500 amp hour battery, so that's that was 90%. So that was a 90% that, that, So that was after a year. That was, yeah, I would have expected to be able to get closer to the full 500, but you know, going much beyond 90% was getting dangerous anyway. So I was like, yeah. okay, so that, that, that wasn't too dismayed with that. Now, after another year and a half has gone by, um, I've done three tests now, and I'm able to get about just 400 to 410 amp hours out of it. So the battery has. Um, its capacity has dropped off uh, over the past year and a half. Um, and I'll be very curious to see where it is another year from now. If it, if it plateaued, um, if it is, uh, uh, the cells are aging strangely. Um, you know, as far as performance in use, it still gives us everything we want. We're able to, to run our air conditioner for all our running errands in the afternoon. If we pull into a, a grocery, grocery store, store or a museum, restaurant, or go for we, a could, hike. we can keep the cat air conditioned while we go and do things. Without having Everything's about the cat, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, when we're, and when we're Walmart boondocking at night, um, we can put the space heater in the bedroom and run it for an hour before bedtime and get the room nice and toasty, run it for a little bit in the morning, and uh, um, still do that all off the batteries. We're still, still able to do very high current things. and. You know, we wouldn't have been using that extra capacity. We, we, we considered 80% our cutoff now. It's just now we don't really have much beyond where our normal cutoff would have been. Um, very curious to see how it, it continues to age over time. Um, and let's see, what other updates in lithium? Um, there are the companies that we know of that are doing kind of package systems for RVers. The one that's gone the farthest is called Lithionics. They were just getting started uh, two and a half years ago. Um, they are. They had one in, in beta testing. One in beta test. When we were researching ours, <coughs> and they're continuing to do capacity tests and, and tracking them, and I think their reports have been positive. Yes. Um, well, they've had to replace. They, they've had. They've had some. I, I've yet to see somebody who was doing real measured training. The, the one guy who was their beta tester and blogging about it. Um, with his basic his tests were it seems to still be working as opposed to I drained it and it's got this many amp hours out of it. He's never done a test like that. But he went back to Lithiomics last yeah. summer, I thought, yeah. and did a full test with them. And I thought they put it on uh, equipment and did 
I didn't. That's what Lithionics was. Yes, too. yeah. The, <laughs> there, there's so 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 Lithionics is a company that I'm, I'm very eager to see somebody who knows what they're talking about um, really use and dissect one of their batteries. And we know some people who have who had very negative experiences, um, but. The company's got the right idea and the right vision, and that was quite a long time ago, so hopefully they fixed all their bugs. Because um, all they're basically doing behind the scenes is packaging up the same cells from China that anybody else would get, and then doing the safety tests and stuff so they can sell them as complete systems, and then, of course, marking them up accordingly. I'm giving you a five-year warranty on them. Yeah, theoretically, their warranty... We don't have a five-year warranty yeah. on <laughs> Yes, we do not. <laughs> and uh, their, their warranty on their website has changed several times, too, so I'm not sure what they're actually claiming is a warranty anymore. Um, there's a couple others that are doing the same things. I'm trying to remember. One, one of them was uh, slightly shady in that you know, they were not doing the, t the tests on the batteries. They were just shipping them and saying, here, you assemble them yourself once you get them, but they were still giving you the markup as if they were doing all that extra work. Um, and what else? Uh, Master Volt, Victron. And then, yeah, and then at the high end in the yacht space and, the, and or the very high end, there's Master Volt and Victron, the company that makes our inverter, is now starting to do lithium batteries that will integrate, plug in directly to the inverter, all fully happy and supported at the factory level. Um, but those are at more still at the yacht market pricing, or maybe if you drive a, a, a Prevo level pricing. Um, and I don't know, I guess that's kind of our update after two and a half years of playing with this stuff. And um, we're happy to take questions. All right, so if anyone in our live studio audience has questions, go ahead and ask them. Those of you on the video chat, I'll come over and start reading the questions. Go ahead and start queuing yours up as well, and uh, we'll address them as they come in. Yes? What's your the approximate weight of the battery assembly? 140 pounds. So the question was asked is how much did ours weigh? It's 144 pounds. Uh, it, it, it's about a quarter of the weight of the same amount of lead and half the size, if I remember right. Yeah, so for for a vehicle, that makes a big difference. Questions? Let's see. Someone asked, uh, what is the AC BTU max on the batteries? The AC BTU? Our, our well, our, that, that mostly comes down to what the inverter can power. Our, our inverter is a 3000 VA inverter that can power our um, 15,000 BTU uh, front air conditioner right now um, without much else on at the same time. So that, that air conditioner is 15,000 BTU, and it draws about uh, 180 amps off the batteries while that is running. Okay. Um. When asked, uh, would you do it again? Um, yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's for our setup where we didn't have an existing place to put in AGMs and stuff. Um, it still makes a lot of sense, and this is fun to us. It's it's fun to play with this and be on the bleeding edge. Um, Love spending money. Yeah, it's fun. Well, well, and, 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 and in particular, actually, like if you look right now, the system for us to Olivier just put in. Um, the Balcon cells, I guess I forgot to mention, is those big cells, they're having ridiculous prices on them. Forest's 1,000 amp hour system um, was $3,300, which is what we paid for our roughly the 500 amp hour system. And that's, uh, he would have paid more than that for an equivalent AGM system. So in his case, for that system he was building, the, the batteries are now cheaper, plus they have all the other advantages. Right. And in particularly, if you if, if the systems get stable enough that they do ex have a longer lifetime and you get two or three times the life out of them as you do out of an AGM, you're potentially way, way ahead on cost. And at the very least, Forrest is demonstrating you're already at break-even on day zero with it's compared it's to AGMs. I just build an AGM system and I'm, I'm having slight regrets right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, the only reason not to do this is if you want somebody else to blame if things don't work, um, and well, and then you, there, you can. You just yes. you pay double <laughs> than right. the do-it-yourself price, right? And then you can have someone to blame. Someone to blame. Um, but and um, and you you have to you know take the time to figure, understand it, understand that you're you're still playing around in some uncharted waters, and um, 
So we, we have people, everybody who asks us, writes to us and says, would you recommend we do this and tell us what to build? If right. they ask, tell us what to build. Yeah, if you need that much of advice with it, it's yeah. just not. If, if you need somebody to tell you what to build, then you're not. Then you're going to blame them if it doesn't work. Yeah. So <laughs> no, we do not tell people what to build. We do not give right. that sort of advice just right. because we don't want that liability. We're not in business. To, we're not in business with right. lithium. This isn't. And, and what we do, and we and don't have the and liability. And here we are, two and a half years later. Ours has degraded more yeah. than we expected. We're still trying to nail down the theories of, of why that is and mm -hmm. how it will continue to degrade. Um, but still, we've gotten two and a half years of really great, solid use out of these, doing things that uh, mm -hmm. um, wouldn't have been able to do if we had gone with a more traditional setup. Um, but if somebody copied us, they'd probably be like yelling and screaming. Lithium <laughs> store better than the lead acid right off the get go. They store how? Store better. They take lack of use better. Yes, yes, they take lack of use great. The the big unknown for lithium is how well do they take floating use? You know, that kind of of, of lack of use but still plugged into the wall use is um, is still an open question of what is the best way to care and feed for lithiums in a floating system. Because in an electric car where these have been mostly been played with, you're you're not floating. You charge the battery and then you're done. And when you're in use, you're draining the battery. Um, floating is still, you know, which is very common in RVs, is still more of uh, uncharted waters. All right. Um, someone asked, how long can our capacity last us? <laughs> it really depends <laughs> upon usage. <laughs> so for running the air conditioner, we usually get about two hours, two and a half hours off of the current capacity, which is, like you said, around 400 amp hours. Um, if we're just running the computers and the Wi-Fi equipment and the LED lights, i.e. the essentials, um, then you know, we could, I think we've gone 36 to 48 hours in that sort of mode. Um, you know, we're usually sacrificing. Well, see, we also every, we have to remember we're completely electric. We have absolutely no propane on board. We ripped out the propane system. So, even heat our water. With so water. our hot water heater. This was another question that was on here: is how do we heat our water? Our hot water is also on electric. Uh, so if we are running off grid, we turn on the hot water heater for about 20 minutes. That gets it heated up enough to, for us both to get a shower in and do the dishes. We turn it off after that. And that does drain the battery some. You do have to account for that. All of our cooking is off electric. We use an induction cooktop. Um, so if we were just running the 12 volt systems, we'd probably be able to go. Yeah, so it matters. Are we eating out? Are we time. eating in? Are we doing baby wipe showers? Or are we actually taking showers? Um, so yeah, a lot of capacity. We can, if we wanted to extend it, we can make it last two or three days on our capacity. Or four or five if we didn't. And remember, when we talk about running computers. We're running 27-inch IMAX. Yeah. <laughs> so. Right. And uh, um, yeah, and if w once we have, you know, our goal is to, in the, the over the course of the next year, to have enough solar to handle our ba basic daily load as well. So that then we'd hopefully be able to go. You know, the the lithiums would bridge us through the cloudy days and. You know, needing to run high current things like air conditioning and stuff for short periods of time. Okay. Um, let's see. Heat. Uh, the cells you have don't like being charged below freezing. Do you have plans for that situation? Drive south. Lithium batteries do not like to be charged while they're below freezing. They can operate below freezing. They can put out current below freezing. Some of the, of the fancier lithium systems actually have heating blankets built into them so that the battery will keep itself slightly above freezing, use some of its power. Um, our, our plan is, well, you know, we, we put a temperature sensor. We have temperature sensors in this bay so we know where the temperature is. We avoided having that bay get below freezing. Um, and actually, ultimately, we're going to relocate the batteries to be in the same bay as our plumbing bay so we'll have a shorter wiring run. And then that's the one bay we just have every reason in the world to keep above freezing. Um, and it doesn't take much to keep a bay just like a light bulb. Yeah, a light bulb. Not, not an either. LED light bulb. Yeah. We've discovered LED. that. <laughs> you got to go find one of those incandescent ones. And they have this kind of vintage section. Of the, of the it's kind of hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'm guessing this is not something the RV newbie should look into unless they're inclined to electrical work. That is yeah. absolutely 100% true. Um, two and a half years in use is still no big push in the industry for regular RVers. Wonder why? Because it's still untested. We're, we're the guinea pigs. Yep. Um, two hours for AC with your capacity is exactly what I was looking for. Yay. Uh, when you add solar, how will the solar charging be controlled? Um, <laughs> with a solar charge controller. Um, <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> no, no, we're going to put Kiki on the roof and let her manage it. Yeah. So, so ideally, we, we would want a, a solar charge controller that was programmable as well so that we can 
Um, as I play with the settings on the main charger, I can have the solar charge controller match those settings. Um, I probably right now, particularly because we've got this new screen from Victron that is a nice little color graphical display, which I forgot to bring out, but it's, it's sitting inside. You're just all sorts of organized today. <laughs> today was kind of crazy, you know, so <laughs> having the net go away while we were setting up. But, um, but yeah, but if I use the Victron charge control, the solar charge controller, then it will give a nice input on the display and show power coming from the solar panels and power going to the batteries and power coming from the wall and little things bouncing around and animated, and then it will give a historical log of it all, and it will also be internet accessible. So if I'm using, because I've got this display from Victron, I probably would use the Victron solar controller. If I was not using the Victron, um, the great solar controller from Morningstar is very programmable as well, and that's probably one of the top choices. And I've used Blue Sky controllers in the past. On our Oliver, we had a Blue Sky solar controller, and that's also fully programmable. So I'd be able to, if, if I ch decide to change where I'm floating or where my absorption charge points want to be, I could just change them on both and just keep them matched. Um, any any charger that just gives you a little dip switch of uh, lead, AGM, gel, you really don't want to do with lithium because you want to have more control. You want to be able to program it and uh, adjust. Okay. How often do we run off the batteries? All um, the time. How often? Yeah. So we we don't because we do do a lot of camping at campgrounds mainly because you know we. Yeah. We like being in convergences, like we're at here right now at, in Cedar Key, where we all have full hookups at our sites. Uh, we did um, two months of volunteering out at a lighthouse that gave us full hookups. Uh, we spent about five months with my uh, father when he was passing away at a campground with hookups. So a lot of our life has been around. Yep. But a lot of also where we've managed to use the batteries, even using our batteries while plugged in. We do yes. a lot of... Um, so we, uh, one of the biggest things is uh, when we were having the engine rebuild in Billings, Montana this uh, summer, uh, all they were able to do was throw us a 15 amp cord over yeah, an extension, very, very long extension, extension cord, cord, you know, and it was 95 degrees outside. So the we found the lithium battery bank and its boosting ability with the Victron yeah. inverter yeah. we use. Our, our inverter is one of the very few that has the ability to combine shore power with battery power, so that if the if you're you've only got 15 amps of shore power and you turn on the air conditioner and you need 20 amps of draw, the um, you'll, you don't blow the circuit breaker, you actually combine the power from both, keep using 15 amps from the shore, and start draining down your battery. So when we were living on the end of this long extension cord for seven weeks, every day we'd be running the air conditioner, battery would be dropping all the way down, we'd use our battery capacity very fully, and then at night when we no longer needed the air conditioner, the battery is able to charge back up. Yes. So we have used it a lot. Um, not, we've not been completely off-grid much. Maybe we'll do a night or two while we're in transit where we're charging up off the alternator underway. We get in at night, maybe we do a rest stop, a Walmart, Cracker Barrel, yep. driveway surfing with friends or something like that en route. We're able to get through the night, maybe two nights if we're somewhere cool or we find a nice uh, you know, dry camping situation. Batteries have been great for that, allowing us to not be dependent on campgrounds overnight when we're just making a repositioning. Um, but a lot of our uh, big use has been being able to do driveway surfing with friends off of a 15 amp uh, plug-in, like we did in Montana, being able to live in the diesel shop with limited amenities, uh, so Wal that, those sorts of situations. And, and Walmart so nights, and being able to, to do a Walmart night and still get hot water, still run the space heater a little bit. Actually, we've even used the block heater, which uses a ton of current, but our inverter can put it out and our batteries can put it out. And so we can run the block heater for an hour in the morning off of batteries. And then once the engine starts up, we'll let the engine charge the batteries back up. Um, so uh, what are you using to secure the batteries in place? Screws. Um, if oh, you got to take it off the yeah, stupid with, thing. Yeah, with, okay. the, the, the batteries are... are um, it's uh, on a piece of plywood, and they're all bolted down with L brackets. Yeah. And then we've screwed the... Um, the piece of plywood, plywood screwed into the base of the bus. Into the, the, uh, the base of the bus, which is all plywood on the bottom of it. So okay. um, that's how they're secured in our system. Um, would you do anything differently if you started Alvaro today? Uh, well, yeah, because you actually couldn't even copy our system today yeah. because those the straps that let you build the 500 amp hour No longer out of it, available. Those are no longer, they, they don't have any anymore. Um, and also, they would consider that not the recommended way to, to build a system even using so yeah, cells. So, so if we were starting research over today, we'd be starting research over yeah. today, coming up with a necessary... Uh, having kept on top of things, I, you know, I'm really curious because of what I've told Forrest, as far as Olivier is, what he's doing is exactly what I would do if I was starting today. Those, a 1,000 amp hour battery would be Probably our ideal capacity, 
and those four Balcon cells would be the simplest way to build a thousand amp hours. So battery. we'll probably continue to uh, use our system to the max for a while. Uh, we are keeping an eye on the solar industry to do flexible panels on top of the vintage bus to keep the curve of the roof. That uh, technology is not quite there yet. They're running into a lot of problems with the protective coating on those yellowing and scratching up. So they're still, we're not going to take the beginning pigs on that, we've decided, because uh, that's kind of a permanent, more permanent <laughs> install. Uh, so we're letting technology kind of catch up on that, because we're, we're just not needing to be off-grid right now that much. We're kind of enjoying a different lifestyle, taking longer-term stays places. Um, so once that technology catches up, we're ready to invest in solar. At that time, we'll probably look into... Is it time to replace well, we'll probably be picking forest brain yeah. <laughs> on how well his system has right. been working and uh, and learn from from what others have been taking off of what we did. Right. So it's and kind of a paid forward sort of thing. And I'm also you know, the, this new Victron inverter, which is ex externally an exact replacement for the one we have, but it's Victron has improved the CPU on it and has new firmware. And in this since since two and a half years ago when we did this, the the new one now has built-in programming for lithium profiles and stuff. So I'm also very curious to see. What, sm how, how much smarter the um, new inverter can be about charging and managing the lithium batteries. Um, and so I'll be swapping that in in the very, very near future. Um, see, someone asked and asked how much time you spend connected to shore power versus no hookups. I think we already answered that before. Um, <coughs> when you reprogram the charger control to work better with lithium batteries, what are the basic parameter changes you are making? Oh, so, so right now, with the with, with older Victron, um, the, the capabilities I have is I can't turn off an absorption phase, um, which normally at lithium you don't need to have it hold at an absorption point. So I've got it that down to the minimum that the Victron, Victron sets, which is one hour. I've got it set to go absorption to 14.2 volts and then float at 13.55 volts is the, 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 the latest settings I've been trying. Um, the, I've got temperature compensation turned off because lithiums don't need temperature compensation. I've got the, the pupritz loss compensation dialed down to the minimum, um, essentially down to zero. And um, all the other fancy uh, uh, storage mode and uh, um, equalization modes and all those things I've got disabled in the inverter. Um, and that's the, the, the best fit I've been able to come up with with the, the older Victron. I'm just going to be curious to see how what I can play with the um, so Elliot asked uh, if we were doing this for a much smaller camper, say the Oliver or uh, maybe the Lacharo, uh, what capacity would you consider building? So it really doesn't come down to the capacity. You need to look at what you need right. for it. It's not really the size of the camper. I mean, an air conditioner is an air conditioner, right? right? Um, and a microwave is a microwave. It doesn't matter if you have a 30-foot RV or a 17-foot RV. A microwave is going to take the same amount right. of, <laughs> of juice. Um, it's how much battery space you have. So if we were constructing this for our old Oliver trailer, uh, we would look at the battery <laughs> bank size, yeah. the battery tray size, and, and go from there about how much we could squeeze in there, and if that was going to be sufficient enough to run everything we want to run. I think the only thing size is relevant too is uh, you've got a big bus. If you really wanted to slap a bunch of AC lead yeah. acids in there, you'd have the carrying capacity right. to do that. Right. Yeah. All our vehicles don't have that option. For me and my little trailer, so therefore I limited my amp power capacity right. because of my weight capacity. Right. Right. So a smaller camper, you do have the weight capacity issues. You also have space issues. Um, so those are going to be your bigger holdbacks. You know, measure tape measures come in handy for that, um, as well as looking at what your tow capacity is, both of your uh, axle weight and also your tow vehicle if you're you're doing it for a tow behind. Um, I, I first fantasized about the lithium system when we were designing our Oliver, which is the 17 foot trailer we lived in before this. Um, but at the time, you know, the advantages were completely theoretical, but there was no place to get cells. There was no, no real practical way. There was. I thought we looked at it was like fifteen thousand yeah, dollars for there two was and no and practical, half hour. I mean, yeah, there was, there was no nothing practical, practical in our that. budget. <laughs> um, yeah, there's always the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm building a NASA space pro budget or the I've got a racing yacht budget. Um, the racing yacht people basically have budgets of, you know. Not none, you know. It's like whatever makes the yacht go faster go, and so the, there there was some interesting lithium stuff there, um, which actually kind of brings us back to um, lithium safety, which I think is, is I didn't really cover as we went through this, but lithiums have a bad reputation for you know, lithium. The metal burns; it burns very very hot and very ferociously. Um, Boeing suffered a, a very big black eye when their lithium batteries in the new Dreamliner caught fire. 
Um, one of the racing yachts that I was following that was like pioneering doing a lithium system in the racing yacht, the yacht burned and sank in a matter of minutes. Um, that's not good. And, you know, there were even stories of like old laptop batteries and stuff catching fire and exploding. And, you know, you know lithium, lithium has had a bad reputation for a good reason. It has, um, it has potential to burn. One of the major innovations that has happened that has made large lithium cells actually practical is very new. It's only in, I think it was first prototyped in 1999 and like first gone into production in like 2007 and is only in just the last few years gone into larger production is a thing called lithium iron phosphate. So that is a lithium battery mixed with iron, basically. It's not as power dense as the type of lithium that would be in a, um, a laptop battery, but it doesn't burn. The guys who at Elite Power Solutions told us they, they took some of these cells out and tried to destroy them every possible way with shotguns and hammers and everything else. And you could destroy them, but you couldn't get them to burn. You couldn't get a fire no matter how you shorted them out. Well, um, they couldn't. They couldn't. And, and well, these have also been through a very extensive, mm -hmm. the cell at the cell level, very extensive tests. And LFP cells. And that is not a technical claim that anyone's making that, that they're completely safe. And no, very no. careful with that. Yeah. I mean, there is always risk. Yes, yeah, but, but they, they, <laughs> they don't have the same fundamental risk of um, the earlier lithiums. Um, and that's what's made the, the entire industry of let's build bigger ones, bigger than laptop battery size. Let's build them now because this new type of chemistry that is uh, um, much less volatile. Um, so I ask, is any ventilation required for the battery bank? Uh, theoretically, no. Um, you don't want to, to let the battery bank get too hot or too cold. But what, um, what would be those parameters? Well, too cold is below freezing. And too hot is, I think, the, the rating from um, uh, Elite was, I think their batteries were good up to, recommended up to 135 degrees. Um, so it's got a, a range of temperatures there. Um, so Arizona would still be Goldie, Goldilocks. <laughs> <laughs> we were 127 when we installed it. Yes. So we but were kind of close the there. <laughs> in the Bay, it stays, 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 stays cooler. The it does? I should have stayed there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they're, they're theoretically, they, 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 they're, they're charge and the discharge. The, the performance is high heat and I guess over, over cross temperature ranges. From what I've seen of, of lab testing, the lithium batteries don't care too much about the temperature as long as you're within their performance range. Um, lead batteries, you know, just lose a lot of capacity as they get colder. Um, yeah, don't know. We try to keep the temperature pretty moderate. All right, so there's been some questions uh, posed up here about uh, what are the specific um, pieces that we're using. And if you go to technomadia.com slash lithium, uh, you will get a, everything you ever want to know about our lithium battery bank, components, lists, and uh, everything else is all written out there. Um, are there any more if questions? anybody here wants to crawl into the bay and take a closer look. You're welcome yeah, to crawl please. into our bay. I, I, <laughs> you can see how the battery cells are bolted across. You'll see across the right side of the batteries all the sense boards. Up on the back right of the wall, on the, the left side wall is where the inverter is behind the inverter. You'll and see if the, uh, there's uh, any more questions the from the video audience, you have a couple more minutes to shoot them in. Uh, your questions don't necessarily need to be about uh, lithium if you don't wish. If you've got some general nomad ones, we'll be happy to take those as well now. You just have the cells snugly together. They're not compressed or anything. But they're compressed from the sides. It's and more it's to your charger system. Together on top. So yeah, they're pretty, pretty. So you like that? So it, you'll take whatever charge um, you give it. Uh, um, uh, if you're giving uh, it one amp, it'll take one amp. If you're giving, if your charger can handle 100 amps, it can take 100 amps. If you've got a 450 million amp charger, I want it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Carl inside. Yeah, the, 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 the batteries can handle basically any charge current you can manage to put out. Uh, I was just wondering just about like how, how long to, to, to charge it up. So Depends upon how many amps you're putting in and how many amps no, you need to charge. So, <laughs> so, 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 so the bigger you generate it, the more. Well, it's compelled by your charger. charger. Your charger. So, so, so your charger, this is a 100 amp charger. Yeah, 120 amp charger. So, amp we, charger. 120, so we can put 120 amps in an hour. Okay. If we can feed it the 120 amps, we have a four, 500 amp hour battery. Math. <laughs> right. 500 and divided by and we, we can actually <laughs> hook up two of these inverters and then charge at 200 amps. Um, 
off of our alternator. Our alternator is a 220 amp alternator, so if we're not running air conditioning, we're just charging the batteries, theoretically we'd be able to charge <coughs> around 200 amps into the, into the system. Oh, and no, we're not getting into the lithium installation business. No way, <laughs> no how. No. Now Do you were saying <laughs> on the car batteries, they just, they're made just to run down and not be charged. There's like a different kind of battery than the lithium? But you're talking about the electric vehicle battery? Yeah, like a bowl or set, bulk cherry bowl or something like well, that. Oh, no, those, those uh, some of them are lithium, actually, quite a few of them. Yeah, so we bought these, these uh, so we'll ones we got are from. Batteries that's who they normally sell to. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah these were originally, uh, these are being marketed and designed mostly for the EV um, industry. For Electric hobbyists. Oh, okay. These are mostly hobbyists. We've kind of, we're the ones taking them to a new, uh, to a new uh, application. So a lot of them would build these to be like a 96 volt system so that right. they're getting. Or 144 Yeah, volts. yeah. So they're doing really <laughs> rapid high charge rates. That's why these have really high C ratings so they can take a charge really, really quickly and a discharge really quickly. Because they're the putting a lot of energy in and a lot of energy out. Just a lot of energy in and a lot out. Yeah, because we're the ones going to, uh, to uh, the, 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 the cable gauge. <laughs> I didn't have access to four-op wires, okay. so I just used uh, um, one op welding cable and put them in parallel to increase the opacity. Pretty sweet. Cool. Someone okay. asked about porous. Um, blog. I don't think Forrest has a blog, but he is uh, tracking it on the Newell Gurus, Newell, Newell Gurus forums. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to type that URL in there with the sensors that Ustream has. When I do the um, the post that goes along with this thing, I'll be linking to Forrest's chronicle of his install, which Forrest, if you're still listening, your setup looks awesome. I've got a total battery lust. You're going to have the coolest system out there. <laughs> Um, someone's asking about the noceums this year. Has anyone had much issues with the noceums yet here? Ago I had a couple little bites the other day, but I haven't had the noceum issue. Hasn't been that, that bad here so far. So. Oh, oh no, sorry. The, the noceums. There's no Wi-Fi. The noceums. <laughs> it's all mud. It's all cold. Don't come here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> It's, you know, it's cold. freezing cold. It was snowing last We're night. We're a bunch of mean people. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The mojitos are really mixed strong. I mean, really, really weak. Really weak. <laughs> mojitos are really weak this year. No sun. Yeah. 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 Lousy sunset. Can she vote every on stuff? I guess the tide came up. The tide came after a day. Tide only comes in once a day. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's all mud. <laughs> You're getting, you got your last minute warning here, else we're going to shut it off and go back to enjoying sorry, sorry, all these. Sorry for the chaos on the start of this. Uh, the networks were just completely bouncing Crazy. around and changing on us. <laughs> Hope the recording came out okay. <laughs> Um, but uh, <laughs> farewell until next time.